So in the previous videos for chapter 14, we, we've talked about what acids and bases are by the Bronsted definition, donating or accepting a proton. We've also defined pH and pOH and Kw as these convenient relationships to talk about the concentration of H3O plus and OH minus in a given solution. And the thing that dictates that is the strength of acids and bases. And so we're diving into chapter 14.3. This is the first part of this uh, section of chapter 14. Um, there's our learning outcomes and expectations. Feel free to pause and read through those. So yeah, we're talking about relative strengths of acids and bases. And so previously we defined the relationship between these various different things. Kw is equal to H3O or H plus times OH minus, and that's 1 times 10 to the minus 14 at 25 degrees. pH and pOH are just convenient notation for these concentrations. Um, uh, the negative log of Kw times the negative log of H3O plus, negative log of OH minus is equal to 14, a convenient relationship between them. And so we can define something as neutral, acidic, or basic. But you can see that even for all the acids listed here, the pH is different. For the bases listed down here, the pH and pOH are different. And so the question is, what dictates the H plus or H3O plus of these solutions? Um, and the answer is, it's the strength and the concentration of these acids or bases. Not only how much we put in solution, but what are the actual structures and what dictates the acidity associated with those? And so we have two different subclasses. We can talk about strong and weak acids or bases. And so strong acids are things that completely ionize in water. So if you throw H HCl, that's hydrochloric acid, into H2O, it completely dissociates and gener generates uh, basically 100% H3O plus and 100% Cl minus, at least per the amount of HCl that you started with. There's other acids like vinegar, like acetic acid, that only partially ionize. They only go a little bit. And so here's the acetic acid uh, plus H2O gives you H3O plus and C2H3O2 minus. And so there's the acid, there's the conjugate base. It doesn't go completely. It's not as strong as HCl. This is a weak acid. It only goes a little bit this way. And so you'll notice that while for something like HCl and a strong acid, we draw a unidirectional arrow because it basically says it almost all goes this way. There might be some going back the other way, but for the most part, it all exists as this. However, for weak acids, we have a combination of all these things, and that's going to depend on uh, how, how strong that acid is. And so the same thing is true with strong bases. Strong bases completely ionize and water where you take NaOH gets you OH minus plus Na plus. Weak bases only partially ionize in water. So you take something like ammonia, NH3, to give you H2O. And again, we have an equilibrium arrow because it's giving some OH minus and NH4 plus, but some of it stays at this. And so just like we had previously with our equilibrium, we have a K equilibrium constant to describe this. And so um, it's unfortunate we have to memorize things, but once in a while it's worthwhile. And this is one of those cases where there are six common strong acids. And so remember, strong acids are the ones that completely ionize, completely dissociate, go almost entirely to the product side. Here's your list. The, the perchloric acid, sulfuric acid, HI, HBr, HCl, uh, and then uh, nitric acid. And so these are these common strong acids. There's also six common strong bases. So lithium hydroxide, sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, calcium, strontium barium. Uh, it's basically uh, this portion of the periodic table. Um, these strong acids and bases, they completely dissociate. For every strong acid you put in solution, you get an H plus. For every OH minus you put in solution, you steal an H plus from somewhere else. And so, um, yeah, it's worth memorizing these, uh, not just for the sake of this class and exercises we do in this class, but also, I mean, these are the dangerous chemicals that you deal with. And so sodium hydroxide, for example, will turn your uh, skin essentially to soap. It hydrolyzes the phospholipid bilayer in your skin. And so any of these bases will do that. The most common is potassium hydroxide or sodium hydroxide. Likewise, battery acid, uh, that's uh, classic batteries are going to have H2SO4 in them. And nitric acid is sometimes, or HCl is sometimes in cleaning solutions. And so it is worth knowing that these strong acids and bases exist. And what's also important is that if you know the concentration of strong acids, it's really easy to figure out what the pH of that solution is going to be. And so here's just a quick question. What is the pH of a 0.1 molar HCl solution at 25 degrees C? Well, we know the equation HCl plus H2O is going to give us H3O plus and Cl minus. 
And so we can effectively do this math directly. And so if we have 0.1 molar HCl, we have a unidirectional arrow. We know it's going to go this way because that's a strong acid. Effectively, our concentration of H3O plus is going to be 0.1 molar, which means we take the negative log of that. The pH of that solution is effectively going to be 1. And so it's really easy to translate a strong acid concentration into a uh, H plus concentration because the answer will be negative log of whatever that concentration is. Likewise, we can do the same math for uh, sodium hydroxide, where whatever amount of NaOH we put into solution, we're going to get that amount of OH minus. If we take the negative log of that, we can get the pOH, which in this case will be 1.0. Um, and we can do 14 minus that, and the pH of that solution will be 14. And so strong acids and bases, the math is really straightforward. It's just whatever you add, that's the amount of H plus or OH minus you're generating in that solution. And so that gives us nice differentiation between strong acids and weak acids, right? We memorize the six strong acids and that tells us those are going to completely dissociate. We can do that math directly. But what about the weak acids? And not only that, the weak acids are not all equal. Like not all of these have the same direct translation. Some are stronger than others. And so uh, that doing that math only works for the strong acids. And so for these weak acids, we have to define it a different way. And what's convenient about it is we know from our discussion earlier that HA only partially dissociates to give A minus and H3O plus. And so you have a mixture of these guys and you have an equilibrium arrow, which eff effectively tells us this is an equilibrium. And if it's an equilibrium, it means it has an equilibrium constant. This capital K um, is products to the stoichiometry over reactants to the stoichiometry. Products in this case are H3O plus and A minus, the conjugate base, and the acid is this HA. And so we can draw an equation products over reactants, and that gives us an equilibrium constant. But in this case, we're going to put a little lowercase a there. And the A, remember with KW, is the water ionization constant. This lowercase subscript here, it just tells us what type Type of equilibrium this is. It's a special case. All the rules we had previously, they apply. Le Chatelier's principle, everything we learned about K's in chapter 13 applies. It's just this is a particular example of an equilibrium that involves acid-base chemistry. And so if we have HA plus H2O giving H3O plus and A minus, we describe it with an acid ionization constant. It basically says here's the ion that's generated as a result of the acid losing a proton. The acid's in the denominator, the conjugate base is in the numerator, and the H3O plus concentration um, is there. And so this Ka effectively tells you how strong an acid is. And so looking at the numbers again, if K is big, it's big because this number is large and this number is small. If this number is large, it means the equilibrium is heavily favoring generation of this. It basically says HA really wants to give up protons and become A minus. And so that Ka value directly tells you if Ka is large, it is a strong acid. If Ka is small, it's because it doesn't want to go this way. It's not as excited about giving up that proton. This ends up being a weaker acid. And so conveniently now, we don't have to rely on just, you know, this is a scale or relative scale. We have a numerical scale now. And so Ka of strong acids and bases are very large or large. In fact, they're really hard to measure, which is why numbers don't exist here. But you can see the spectrum of all these different weaker acids, HNO2, HF, they have Ka values associated with them. And so the these numbers, 1.5 times 10 to the minus 2, is relatively large compared to 1.1 times 10 to the minus 7. And so all of a sudden we have this 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 k value that gives us a numerical representation of how strong that acid is. The bigger that k, the stronger the acid. The bigger the k, the more it favors generating the conjugate base, which means it's more and more willing to give up that proton. And so we can talk about the same thing with bases, right? There's, there's the six strong bases and then there's everything else. And so everything else has some kind of equilibrium condition where you have A minus plus H2O giving you HA and OH minus. There's the base, there's the conjugate acid. That, that equilibrium tells us something about how strong a base it is. How, how strong or how much does this A minus want to steal a proton from solution? And we can describe that in terms of another equilibrium constant. So products to the stoichiometry over reactants to the stoichiometry. Reactants in this case, H2O is a liquid, so it doesn't show up in this equation. But we have an equilibrium constant that tells us the proportionality between products and reactants. In this case, we're going to add a B, which is a special representation of this particular equation. And B is the base ionization constant. 
it's effectively telling us how willing is this base to steal protons from uh, aqueous solution. And so the larger the KB, the more it favors this side. The more it favors this side, the more it tells you this wants to steal a proton. And so larger KB values mean a stronger base. Smaller KB values mean it's a weaker base. And so again, we have this numerical scale that we can say these number are large. This is a stronger base. This down here is a much weaker base. And so again, this equilibrium constant, same rules from chapter 13. The bigger it is the more it favors products in this case it's basically saying it favors products because this really wants to steal protons it's a strong base and it wants to take protons from things around us so we can do the math if we want to calculate phs of those solutions remember with strong acids and strong bases we say whatever you start with that's the amount of h plus and oh minus you get unfortunately for these weak acids you can't do that math directly instead you have to rely on ice tables and so if you want to know the ph of a 0.36 molar hno3 solution this is not a strong acid this is a weak acid this is hno2 not hno3 hno2 is weak its k is 4.5 times 10 to the minus 4. and so you can see this number is small right it basically says it favors reactants 10,000 times more than products. So basically it wants to stay as this form, but occasionally it'll generate some H3O plus and an O2 minus. Again, it's 10,000 times more favorable to be this than this, but we're still generating H3O plus and we know it's an acid, so it's going to have a acidic pH. But we can actually do the math and figure this out. We can effectively do the same ice table math we talked about at the end of chapter uh, 13. We can say we're starting out with 0.36 molar HNO2. We have zero of this, zero of this. It's going to change. This will go down by X. This will go up by X, go up by X. You can put the uh, equation there, and then you have your equilibrium equation. Ka is equal to H3O plus or H plus times NO2 minus over HNO2. You could plug that in and solve for the algebra, or you could simplify it using X. Again, if, if Ka is small in this concentration is large, X is negligible, we can ignore it, we can solve for it. And so what X effectively gives us if we solve for X is the concentration of H3O plus at equilibrium. And so while we started with this amount of HNO2, when it reaches equilibrium in that solution, there's amount of H plus floating around. That H plus amount is equal to X. The number in this case is 1.3 times 10 to the minus 2. And so if we want to know pH, we just take the negative log of that number, which is this step, and we get a pH of 1.9. And so, yeah, it's not as simple as the, the strong acid math because you're not generating all the protons. You're only generating a fraction of those protons, and so you have to rely on ice table math. And so you can do similar calculations with a base. You can use the KB value to figure out OH concentrations, find POH, 14 minus POH is pH, uh, so on and so forth. But you get the general idea. You can also estimate weak acids, and this is just a convenient skill, especially if you're working with like buffer solutions and a lot of acid-based chemistry. It's, it's nice to estimate this rather than go through the whole ice table. And so one way you can think about that is, is you know these relationships. You know that you know, Ka is, uh, or H3O plus is equal to Ka times HA. It's basically just rearranging that equation. Um, we're not going to get into the details of that, but if you have a strong acid that's 0.36, you can basically do the math directly. You can say the concentration of H plus will be 0.36 and the pH will be 0.44. And so that's the, if it was a strong acid, that's what the highest or the lowest pH it would be. And so 0.44. If it's a weak acid, we know the pH is going to be less than 7, but we don't know how much less than 7. And so we can think about, even if uh, even if we don't want to do the exact math, we can say, okay, this is a weak acid. That weak acid has to give us values somewhere between 0.44 and 7. And so if we think about the spectrum of possible values, this end, there's 7, 0.44. Where does it lie in this line between these two approximately? And so you can think of a, a relatively strong acid, not necessarily one of the strong acids, but it would have a K of 1 times 10 to the minus 1. Uh, alternatively, if you're going to have like a weak acid, it might be 1 times 10 to the minus 14 on this end of the spectrum. And so 1, 1 times 10 to the minus 8 is somewhere in between. You'll be about halfway between those. And so if you think about what this Ka is, 4.5 times 10 to the minus 4, it's going to be somewhere between strong acid and somewhere in the middle. You'll get a pH of about 2. And so that was just based on, you know, here's one extreme, here's the other extreme, here's the halfway point, what's halfway between those halfway points. You can say a Ka of 4.5 times 10 to the minus 4. Um, the concentration will affect that number, which is why it changes, but it'll be roughly 2 or something in that range. And what we found out from our previous calculation is the exact answer, sorry, it's right over there, is 1.9.
And so you can do rough estimates like this, and, and uh, it'll, it'll at least give you a ballpark. You know it has to be less than seven because this is an acid and it's gonna be. You know it's not a strong acid, so it can't be on this end of the spectrum, and so a reasonable answer is somewhere between one and seven. But it's gonna be on this end of the spectrum because it's 10 to the minus four rather than you know 10 to the minus eight or higher. And so yeah, you can do some quick, quick calculations in your head just to figure out roughly what the pH of the solution is gonna be. And this is what you should be doing, even if you have plug and chug math problems you should think about roughly what are those numbers going to be all right so we have ka's we have kb's we talked about the acid uh, equilibrium constant we talked about the base equilibrium constant what's interesting about these two is they're not necessarily independent and so if ha is the acid a minus is the conjugate base a minus is the base ha is the conjugate acid and so ha and a a minus are related to each other and so it turns out if you take this ka and this kb equations and you actually combine them cancel out the ha's cancel out the a minuses and you end up with h2o uh, is an equilibrium with h3o plus and oh minus and immediately it should spark in your brain that what we're looking at is effectively the kw equilibrium and so what this effectively tells us is if we take ka times kb it actually equals kw and so for any given conjugate acid-base pair, we have a relationship between the strength of the acid, the strength of the base, and that is related to the KW equilibrium constant. And so remember, KW at 25 degrees is 1 times 10 to the minus 14. And so we have a fixed number, just like we had with a ratio of H plus or H3O plus and OH minus. KA and KB have to be related by this. And so, yeah, if, if KE is, is a big number, that means KB has to be a small number. If KB is a large number, it means KA has to be a small number. And so what this effectively tells us, if, if HA is a good acid or a strong acid, it's really good at donating H plus and it wants to go to this side of the equation. But that inversely tells you that A minus doesn't, isn't strong and doesn't want to go the opposite way. That's basically what this equation tells you. If Ka is large, it means it wants to go this way, which means the Kb for this guy has to be small. It's not as good at accepting protons and going the other way. Alternatively, we can look at, you know, if A- is good at accepting protons, this is going to have a large Kb value. If the Kb value is large, that means the reverse reaction isn't very favorable because this doesn't want to give up protons. It wants to accept those protons. And so these arrows down here are basically the relationship between that Ka and KB. And so KW is fixed, which means if it's a strong acid, its conjugate is weak. If the conjugate is strong, this one has to be weak because it's a smaller number. And so that's fixed by this relationship. And it's really important to note that it's it's only this math only works for a conjugate acid-base pair. You can't take any random Ka and KB and set it equal to KW. That's not how it works. It's only the relationship between a acid and its conjugate base. And so you can look at this for real acids. And so you can see the H, uh, HF hydrofluoric acid has a Ka of 10 to the minus 4, which means F minus has a Kb of 10 to the minus 10. And so you can see all these multiply any of these together, you get 1 times 10 to the minus 14 because that's the relationship. And so here you can see in tabulated form, again, if you know something about the acid, you know something about the conjugate base. Conjugate base, you know the conjugate acid, and it's based on this relationship right here. And so one of the reasons this is important with strong acids is this relationship still exists, but with strong acids, the Ka effectively is infinity, right? It's a huge number. It only favors products, which means the Kb, the conjugate base, isn't really a base at all. And so if you take something like HCl and throw it in solution, it generates H plus and Cl minus, and Cl minus is not really basic at all, which is why when you add sodium chloride to a water solution, it doesn't, it doesn't become basic. It's because it's such a weak conjugate base because the Ka favors one direction almost completely, which means the Kb is vanishingly small for this Cl minus. All right, so there's the summary. We have strong acids slash bases. They ionize in water. Um, uh, weak acids only partially ionize, and so there's an equilibrium condition between uh, weak acids and weak bases. Uh, there are six common strong acids. Um, those are six that you memorize, and not just for this class, but for life in general. Memorize six acids, memorize the six bases, and assume pretty much anything else that can donate or accept a proton is a weak acid or base. And if they are weak acids or bases, we can describe them in terms of Ka and Kb. It's basically the 
equilibrium constant telling you how good is it at being an acid, how strong is that acid. The larger Ka gives you a stronger acid. Larger Kb is a stronger base. And we showed mathematically you can relate Ka and Kb to Kw, which Kw is a fixed value at a given temperature, and Ka tells you something about the acid, Kb tells you something about the conjugate base. And so now we have all these relationships tying these values together and allowing us to define numerically how strong is an acid, how strong is its conjugate base based on these relationships. All right, so that closes out part one of the relative strengths of acids and bases. Next, we'll get into the structural parameters that actually dictate those properties.